Today is August 24th. This is our New Jersey webinar series. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Today we're going to talk about defending motions for temporary medical benefits, also commonly called motions for med and temp. So today we're going to talk about medical care in general, what kind of medical care is required under the New Jersey Workers' Compensation Act. We're going to talk about ending medical, how we put a stop to it when we're controlling uh, and selecting physicians. We're going to talk a little bit about different types of motions for med and temp, because there are two common motions for med and temp. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, defenses and give some practical advice uh, on how we defend motions for med and temp. All right, you're telling me that there's it's going in and out? That's not good, is it? Let's see. Something might be loose. Loose wire? We're back? Audio's good? Okay. Uh, all right, I hope everybody was able to hear everything. And finally, I'm going to finish up. Uh, with just a quick discussion of what's going on with COVID-19. The law changed in New Jersey. Uh, if the governor does not sign it or veto it, it will be going to effect on September 14th. So I'm going to talk about the new COVID-19 presumption uh, in New Jersey workers' compensation cases. So let's just quickly talk about uh, medical care in general. And before I go on, just please remember this is completely and totally live, as you just see from that uh, little uh, blackout that we had there for just a second, that little blip. Uh, please ask me questions. It makes it a lot more fun. I will answer your question live. I will not say uh, your full name. I'll just say your first name so you know I'm answering your question, and then I will read the question and answer it for everyone uh, so we can all be on the same page. All right, a quick medical treatment overview. New Jersey is uh, one of the states where you are allowed to direct and control care. Uh, everything uh, under uh, the statute for required care uh, is curative and palliative. So in New Jersey, uh, you must provide care to bring the claimant to their maximum medical improvement plateau. And after that, palliative care is still required underneath the act. Uh, now, as the employer or carrier, you have the opportunity to select the physicians. And this is important in two respects. First, in general, uh, my clients are using PPOs uh, or networks of providers so that they are obtaining the best medical providers for their uh, 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 patients. Uh, we're also choosing providers who are conservative in general and who are in general um, going to release the claimant to maximum medical improvement quickly. All right, I see over there that it's blacking in and out, flipping in and out. Uh, strange. I'm just going to keep going. Uh, uh, estimates of overall network penetration in New Jersey is over 90%, so over 90% of the time. It should be a physician that you have selected and chosen who will be treating your petitioner, and that's a great way to control costs. That other eight or nine percent of time uh, where it's not a network physician is usually the cases of emergent or urgent care. Um, all right, next, uh, you control uh, pharmacy uh, prescriptions, where they're filled and how they're filled, and you also control uh, where the claimant gets their diagnostic testing. So you get to select the MRI facilities, select the radiolo radiology facilities that are using. And of course, we're generally trying to direct our claimants, uh, petitioners, towards better diagnostic facilities. And that means higher uh, power magnets, et cetera. So we're getting better diagnostics. Uh, part of directing care means you can also send the claimant to functional, capa functional capacity evaluations. And you can do that anytime you want during the pendency of a case. And that's a great way to get some realistic outlook on what kind of work the petitioner can do and what kind of accommodations need to be provided to the petitioner. All right, we also dispute and deny medical care, particularly that uh, which is excessive or that's not curative. So um, when we deny or dispute medical care, we're controlling care. So we're simply usually not authorizing it. Oftentimes the risk professional, the adjuster is gonna reach out to the petitioner and say, look, your doctor wants to do X, Y, Z, but we don't, uh, pay for that. We don't provide that. And the reason for it is it's not efficacious. It's experimental. Uh, it doesn't work, et cetera. So whatever reason we want to give them or no reason at all, we can just simply say we're not authorizing that. Uh, examples of the types of authorizations that get withheld are things like unnecessary multiple surgeries, exploratory surgeries, things like manipulation under anesthesia, things like multiple diagnostics. You know, that third MRI is probably not going to tell you anything different from the second MRI, that type of thing. Um, now, 
the petitioner has no right uh, to sue us for denying or disputing medical care or challenging us. Their only um, way that they uh, can challenge us is by filing a motion within the New Jersey workers' compensation system. And that motion is called the motion for temporary uh, and medical benefits. And it's essentially the claimant coming forward and saying like, I need this care. Uh, I'm being denied this care and judge, you should provide it to me. Now, the motion can also be uh, for the withholding of temporary disability benefits. However, those are not really ripe and shouldn't really be heard in workers' compensation court. And generally speaking, a motion that's only seeking disability benefits, saying I'm done with care, but I'm, I'm still temporarily disabled, usually that will be resolved or held to the end of the case and will get resolved at the same time that the overall permanent residual disability, if there is any, is resolved. All right, why do we care about the ability of the claimant to file a motion asking the judge of compensation to intervene in the case and direct us to provide specific care that the claimant is seeking. Well, first, we're gonna lose medical control. And this is the worst and most dangerous aspect of a motion for med intent. And by the way, I've seen very abusive motions for med intent. I've seen motions filed for things like, we're not filling a prescription fast enough. Uh, petitioner's attorney saying, oh, it's been three days and the prescription hasn't been filled. Therefore, I'm filing a motion for med intent. So uh, doing things, on purpose so that they can gain the upper hand in the case. Once they start controlling medical care, picking doctors, picking the types of treatments that the petitioner is gonna get, uh, obviously they're now in the driver's seat and they're gonna drive that medical up as high as they can because our, our compensation system, we're not talking about treatment anymore, now we're talking about the way the petitioner is awarded a permanent residual disability benefit. It generally is just awarding them a benefit for the amount of treatment that they've undergone. Uh, in New Jersey, the concept of permanent residual disabil disability or permanent partial disability is very divorced from the idea of any actual functional uh, limitation on the petitioner. It's just really how much care they got and how much time they were out of work. So uh, loss of medical control will significantly increase our exposure in a case. Dangerous. Next, petitioner's attorney gets paid an attorney's fee for the value of any additional lost time benefits or medical care that they win for the petitioner. So that's dangerous. And that is the incentive for petitioner's attorneys, by the way, to file these motions for med intent because, hey, they're looking at this and saying, hey, there's an opportunity here for me to get a fee during the case. Uh, so that's what they're doing. Now, how do they file a motion or what are the parts of a motion? Really, the motions all have, have to have the same requirements and the burden is on the petitioner bringing the motion to show that they have satisfied the requirements of the rules and filed a motion which meets those requirements. So the first one is there has to be some sort of notice. Uh, the, the notice, by the way, is not standardized, although the board, uh, the workers' compensation courts have published a standard motion. Uh, but the notice puts all the parties on, on notice that, hey, by the way, I'm filing a motion. And if you don't do anything, respondent, it's going to be granted. Second part is an affidavit. Now, the affidavit has is very clear as to what it has to state. It has to state that, A, the petitioner is seeking some additional medical care. B, that the carrier or respondent or employer was asked to provide that care and refused to do it and see that if the petitioner doesn't get that medical care, uh, they're gonna be worse off. So that the care has to be curative. It has to be something that's gonna actually cure, help, soothe, diminish, or palliate uh, the petitioner's complaints. Um, there has to be an included medical report, and these can be pretty net actually, but there needs to be some medical report in there from some doctor saying, I want to do X, and that could be, by the way, diagnostic, that could be physical therapy, that could be surgery, it could be anything, really, but there needs to be a note in there from a doctor saying, I want to provide X care. Uh, those are the parts uh, that, of the motion that have to be brought. Now, uh, the procedure on a motion for med intent. First, the motion's filed. Within 21 days, we have to respond and file an answer. Uh, by the way, if you don't file an answer within that time period, uh, you may waive your right to defend the motion. So that's a very important time period. Uh, the time to file an answer to a claim petition, so the beginning of a case, the original complaint, is 30 days. But the time to file an answer to a motion for med and temp is 21 days, and we've got to keep that in mind. Uh, next, uh, within 30 days, the case will be listed for uh, a proceeding before the judge of compensation, and we must get our IME done before then. Next, um, within 35 days, that IME report has to be received. And generally speaking, we're gonna have a conference with the judge uh, or a trial on that issue. So that it's a very short period of time. But in reality, almost it's almost impossible to get an IME or get a second opinion 
within that 30 day period. And so that 30 day period is almost always relaxed and extended. And also generally we'll have a conference with the judge of compensation after the motion is filed, but before there are any uh, litigation proceedings where all the parties will come and sit down and generally talk about that motion. Now, interestingly, the workers' compensation courts in New Jersey have been closed to any kinds of uh, live court proceedings since March 16th. Okay, so we're now in our solidly five months going on six months of the courts being closed. Uh, however, the judges are, by way of telephone conference uh, or video chat, uh, handling settlements and they are handling motions for med and temp and conferencing them because these are considered by the workers' compensation courts uh, throughout the state as high priority or high urgency matters. And so for that reason, these do get the attention of the judge and they do get the input of the judge. Now, as you can imagine, typically when the petitioner comes to court and says, I want XYZ medical care, uh, the bias of the judge is generally to say, hey, let's just provide it to them. Let's let that happen. Uh, in general, we need to be very well prepared in order to dispute that because really uh, when the petitioner is requesting additional care in general, the judge is going to be very sympathetic to that position. So we need to be ready to uh, respond. Now, when there is a trial on medical benefits, and oftentimes we will try a motion for med intent within the case, and we're not trying the whole case. We're not trying the amount of permanent residual disability. We're not dismissing the case. We're not seeking a judgment. We're just trying the case on the issue of, is this medical care necessary? And oftentimes we look at the medical care and you say, well, look, they're looking for 12 more physical therapy visits. Why don't we just authorize three or four, see if that does better, and that way we can sort of compromise or resolve them. But where the petitioner is seeking something like a surgery or other invasive care, uh, I'm thinking of things like multi-level lumbar fusions or cervical fusions that we know are going to lead to more and more problems in the case and more and more exposure in the case. Uh, those are the times when we look at them and say, you know, these are, this is worth a trial. We need to dispute this and we need to win on this because A, uh, the medical care may worsen, uh, certainly won't improve the claimant and we can make those statements based on our em empirical or anecdotal observations and also cases where uh, the claimant is resisting being found at maximum medical improvement for a long period of time by seeking more and more medical opinions uh, or trying to uh, shoehorn more body parts into the case. And so those are the contexts in which we're actually going to have a trial on a motion for med intent. So the petitioner testifies first. Then we're allowed to bring any fact witnesses we want to dispute. In general, there are not fact witnesses uh, in a motion for med intent defense. Uh, typically, the petitioner, when they're testifying, the only real questions we're going to ask them are, look, you're seeking XYZ treatment. And sometimes this treatment can be quite invasive. It could be surgical. And it's important that we get the petitioner on the record saying, yeah, if judge, if you approve this treatment, I'm actually going to get it. Because many times we fight and fight with our adversary for some type of uh, surgical proceeding or invasive proceeding. And then ultimately the petition is, I don't want that anyway. Uh, so, you know, we want to get them on the record saying, you know, I don't want to actually, actually have the treatment that they're seeking. The petitioner then presents their own medical witness. Most times this is going to be the treating doctor saying, yep, uh, this is a failed laminectomy and I need to do it again. Or I need to do uh, some other type of procedure. I need to do a fusion at this point, or I want to do something experimental. So we're needing that petitioner's treating doctor to testify. In weak cases, the petitioner will not have a treating doctor testify, and instead it will be some IME doctor uh, that they've uh, hired to give their opinion that they need more medical care. Uh, after the petitioner's medical witnesses testify, then our expert or our second opinion or evaluating physician will testify on our behalf. Uh, so those are the, the steps of the case. Next. The uh, Workers' Compensation Court also has something called an emergent motion. And the emergent motion is really meant to address situations in which the petitioner does not get this treatment now, they will be permanently uh, and perhaps mortally uh, harmed. Uh, in that uh, in case, we have only five days to respond to the emergent motion. The emergent motion, by the way, requires the petitioner's affidavit or statement that if I don't get this treatment right now, I'm going to die or be permanently harmed. And so it's a very high threshold. Uh, we then file an answer. We have a conference with the judge of compensation within five days of filing or 10 days uh, from uh, five days of answer or 10 days of filing. So very quickly, usually the same week. Uh, and in fact, in the emergent motions that I've defended, sometimes I've had a conference with the judge and my adversary before I even filed my answer, before the five days were even up, uh, because the allegations in the emergent motion were so significant and maybe so salient. So in those circumstances, we have a quick discussion with everybody. Now, interestingly, in all the motions, emergent motions that I've defended, I've actually never had to take one to trial because after they were discussed with all the parties, 
it was like, this is an emergent at all. This is not urgent. This is just, you know, maybe the claimant is pushing or maybe they think this is going to help puff up their third party case or whatever other reason. And they've in general been taken off that uh, urgent or emergent motion list. We have to get our IME within 15 days. And then the case is set down for something called a continuous trial. And what a continuous trial just means is all the witnesses testify on the same day or on successive days, one day right after the other, which is a real nightmare in terms of scheduling uh, people for trial testimony. In general, trials in New Jersey workers' compensation courts are non-continuous, which means that they fall on 21-day cycles. So it's very easy to forecast into the future the days of all the witnesses are gonna testify. It's a little easier to organize your witnesses in a non-continuous trial. So the emergent motion procedure is really meant to get to the heart of these cases in which the claimant needs urgent care, where it's being denied and their life's in danger. Uh, in general, this is a tiny percentage of the motions that we actually defend, uh, probably 1% of them that we are defending right now. So really not a big impact of this emergent motion procedure. All right, how do we defend motions? Well, there are many ways, but I'm gonna talk about the best and strongest methods. First is a focus on the rules. There are significant rules around merge, uh, motions for med intent. And those rules are very demanding as to what the petitioner has to show on their own papers. They have to show A, that their treating doctor or a doctor is recommending a specific treatment, B, that they requested that treatment from someone, C, that it was denied, and then D, that they need it, that it's actually curative, that's gonna actually help or heal them or palliate them in some way. So oftentimes we're holding them to the rules and we're saying, look, um, first of all, you never requested it from us. And that's come up in the context of the cases where the petitioner has been prescribed a medication and then they didn't get it filled within three days or they, um, uh, the respondent didn't immediately get it scheduled, for example, a diagnostic test, and they go and file a motion. That motion's defective if they haven't first said, hey, uh, remember us? Um, we have this MRI prescription from the treating doctor and you were supposed to schedule that, but you never scheduled it. Hello, remember? So if the petitioner's not asking us first, uh, the motion is defective on its face and should be dismissed. That's a hugely powerful rule, and that's a rule that we're relying on a lot to get these motions dismissed. I can tell you that sometimes the motions get filed by overzealous uh, counsel, or maybe their paralegal prepares it and files it based on whatever the petitioner is telling them. We're often able to just call our adversary and say, um, hello, uh, now that you're bringing this to our attention, we're very happy to authorize this diagnostic test or care or fill this prescription or whatever it might be, but you guys got to ask us for these things first. So I'm going to demand that you're going to withdraw your motion. And oftentimes we can resolve the case uh, very simply and very easily in that way. So the first thing is rules. Next, uh, filing an actual answer to the motion for med intent. You know, the case law is replete with sort of sloppy defense work where the defense was like, yeah, it's New Jersey. I don't really have to file an answer on time. I'm just going to, the judge will let me skate on this one. I'll just show up in court and make an argument. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, really need to file your uh, response within the 21 days. Oftentimes, you don't have enough information to file a valid response or a full response. And what I mean by that is, you know, the uh, petitioner is asking for some medical care, and we're not really certain, was it even provided? Was it requested? Did they request it of us first? We still have a little bit of investigation or determination to make. And our first stop will be to file something in court, just basically saying, hey, we're raising all defenses while we investigate this motion. Uh, judge, give us a chance to sort of look into this. I think that's a fair thing to do, particularly motions now, they're filed electronically, so they just show up in your email. And we want to make sure these things don't slip through the net. So very important that some type of answer is filed, even if it's sort of like a holding vague answer, just so that you have the opportunity to raise your defenses later. Next, um, presenting proofs is important, and don't forget you have the opportunity to present proofs. You know, I've got cases in which the petitioner is demanding X, Y, Z, uh, very invasive care, or some sort of sophisticated cutting edge uh, therapies that maybe are not, they're sort of semi-experimental, uh, or where the petitioner is claiming that they're totally disabled and they need this treatment. Well, just remember, you have the opportunity to refute all of those claims and any of the claims. And also you can refute the way that the petitioner is presenting to their treating physician. Particularly if you've got video of the claimant going about their activities of daily living with really no obvious impairments, that might be an opportunity to bring that video forward and rely on that. So don't forget you have fact defenses in a motion for men and temp. It's not just my doctor asked for this, now I get it. It's, well, uh, you're seeking something that is that we've decided not to authorize or maybe exceeds the boundaries of normal medical course. And so we're gonna really uh, challenge whether this is necessary or not. Um, 
I'll always go back to those basics. You know, when did they request this care from us? Who was it requested of? And if the answer is they haven't done that, the motion is defective on its face. Uh, the Benson standard. Don't forget about this as well. There's case law in New Jersey that says uh, where the petitioner goes out and gets medical care on their own. Let's say they don't file a motion. They just go and you know, they decide I'm going to get this treatment that I saw advertised on TV. Uh, we don't have to pay for that treatment. We don't have to authorize it. Or we don't, we're not responsible for it unless it actually improves the petitioner's uh, medical picture. Uh, and so that's really meant to diminish the petitioner going out and just getting all sorts of crazy uh, kooky uh, defenses. Uh, uh, or kooky uh, medical treatments. Uh, now, Benson doesn't apply where it would be futile for the petitioner to ask us first for authorization for that medical care. And what I mean by that is, you know, they're bleeding. Uh, they've had a, a, a significant relapse in their condition and they need to go to the emergency room right now. Well, they don't need to ask us for permission first. Go take care of that medical emergency first. So if it would be futile to ask us to authorize this medical care in advance, uh, even if it doesn't heal them, uh, it may be still permissible and we're, we may still be liable for it as the employer carrier uh, in the case where it would have been futile to ask for it from us in advance because they couldn't because it's emergent, which again, I think makes sense. All right. Um, when the If we're going to try these cases, it's also important to ask the petitioner on the stand, do you actually want this care? You know, we've had this happen many times where the petitioner actually gets up on the stand and, you know, we've now explained to them by the way, this doctor wants to do a multi-level fusion. You understand that they're going to be taking bone out of your hip because they're going to do an autologous bone transfusion. They're going to take bone out of your hip and they're going to glue and sew it into your spine to freeze your spine in place. This is an incredibly invasive procedure and to require physical therapy, all sorts of, you know, the person sits there and they go, you know, maybe I really don't want this uh, crazy surgical plan that's been uh, suggested to me. So it is important to put them on the stand and have them repeat that they actually want the treatment so that we're not going through the motion for no good reason. Um, so there needs to be some sort of statement on the record that they would actually accept the care that they're seeking. Um, also interesting is many times we've had motions filed for care that the petitioner has actively refused in the past. And I really I think we're getting into a situation where we have overzealous opposing counsel who they're seeing this care being recommended multiple times and never being authorized and saying, oh wait, I'm filing a motion now because I'm gonna get money for this. Uh, maybe it's because your own petitioner has refused to undergo that care because they don't want that kind of invasive uh, care. All right, uh, last thing I'm gonna suggest here about defending motions is in general, it is inappropriate for a motion to be filed and treated with a high level of urgency when the only thing it's seeking is payment of temporary disability benefits. Uh, really, those cases, those issues should be resolved at the end of the case. All right, what happens after an order is entered? So let's say there has been a motion for med intent filed, it's been fully litigated, and we have not prevailed. The judge has decided, nope, I'm going to approve this medical care. Uh, first, you have the right to appeal that decision. It's appealable as of right, and you can appeal it right then and there. And the reason it's appealable is because money is moving and something's changing. There is no stay on that level of appeal. That first level of appeal in New Jersey goes to Superior Court, third department of the appellate division. So, uh, you, you know, you're going right to the appellate division and uh, you're not going to get a, uh, a stay. So there's no tactical reason to file an appeal unless you think the judge is really wrong. So it is appealable, but in general, you need to be thoughtful about it because there is no stay on litigation. When the order is entered, we always have to pay a lot of attention to the specific wording of the order. And I'll tell you how we get in trouble on these. And I've seen clients get in trouble on these, and I've seen attorneys get in trouble on these. Uh, where the petition, where the order gets entered, let's say the petitioner files a motion and says, uh, I want 12 more weeks of physical therapy. Okay, uh, we try the issue and we don't prevail. The judge says, all right, I'm ordering the 12 weeks of physical therapy. Don't let some sloppy language get into that order that says something like uh, medical care as per Dr. So-and-so uh, until MMI or medical care as per Dr. So-and-so. Because what you have done there is you haven't just approved the 12 weeks or you haven't just lost on the 12 weeks of physical therapy. You've actually now lost medical control of the case and anything Dr. So-and-so, who maybe right now is saying he needs 12 more weeks of physical therapy, anything they say going forward is now going to be relied upon by the petitioner as part of the motion order and uh, our right to refuse to authorize or dispute that care may be lost. But even more troubling, instead of paying an attorney's fee 
based on the cost of that 12 weeks of physical therapy, you're not going to pay an attorney's fee on any medical care that happens after that order. So be very careful with that. And that's why I say on those orders, be careful about anything that says any follow-on treatment is recommended. When we argue a motion for med intent, we should be arguing that this is for a very specific treatment. There's a specific treatment course, judge, that this claimant is seeking, not this specific treatment plus anything else that follows afterwards. If you allow them to say something like, uh, a respondent will authorize and provide laminectomy, comma, plus any necessary follow-on care, you've just greatly expanded your exposure for attorney's fees in that case. So that's something to be very worried about. Also, oftentimes the judge will say, I'm not going to add a fee onto this just yet, gentlemen uh, or ladies. I'm going to say fee to abide, meaning we'll figure out later exactly how much medical care was authorized and provided under this order. And then we'll figure out later how much the counsel's fee, remember opposing counsel gets paid a counsel's fee on the amount of medical treatment and lost time they win for the petitioner. Again, that's their incentive to file lots of these motions. The fee to abide is a very dangerous thing because really what you're gonna end up with at the end of the case, a new argument where petitioner's saying, petitioner's counsel is gonna say, well, I'm due a fee on the permanent residual disability. Plus let's go back and calculate all the medical and all the lost time that I could be due a fee on over here. And if you don't put it in that order, you're gonna leave yourself open to having to argue that later in the case. So we wanna be very specific. We're gonna say, hey, judge, we're authorizing, you're authorizing this very specific treatment. Here's what the estimated cost of that is, judge. This is what it's limited to. Let's do the fee right now. As you can imagine, opposing counsel doesn't like it when we try to limit their fee to what uh, a specified specific amount early in the case. They'd much ha be happier uh, trying to figure out six months from now or a year from now later on when everybody's lost track of what exact care was uh, described under that order. All right, so that's a little bit about defending motions for med and temp. Uh, let me just give everybody a quick COVID-19 update. Uh, New Jersey on July 31, uh, 2020, did pass, the assembly did pass the Senate's bill, that's S-2380, which creates a presumption in favor of essential workers who claim that they obtained or were infected with COVID-19. Uh, this creates a rebuttable presumption, uh, which means it's up to us to show that there is some other place that they actually contracted the condition, and that's defined in the, the new statute itself. Uh, it is currently unsigned uh, by Governor Murphy of New Jersey. It is on his desk for signature. The law in New Jersey is if a bill remains unsigned for 45 days, it becomes law on the 45th day, which means September 14, 2020, this uh, bill would become law. And again, it would create a rebuttable presumption in favor of all essential workers uh, that uh, contracted COVID-19, that they did contract it through work. Now, the, the law is a little bit um, dangerous because of two reasons. One, it goes back in time and grandfathers in all COVID-19 cases or positive uh, diagnosis since March 9, 2020. So it goes all the way back really to the beginning of the panic and would allow anybody who had any of these conditions uh, to bring the claim now. The second reason it's dangerous is because it says uh, first responders, medical employees, and quote, anybody else uh, who has been deemed essential by a governor's order. Well, the governor's had over 70 orders, finding nearly every single occupation and profession, uh, every single job and every single industry essential, uh, with very, very narrow exceptions. So far, uh, they haven't made uh, uh, gym facilities or gyms uh, essential employees, but essentially everybody else has been deemed an, an essential employee. Uh, there have been about 70 subsequent executive orders after March 2020, and each one of them has repeated the list of essential workers and added a few more, uh, and the list has gone on, and it's pretty much every single employment in the state of New Jersey. To defend these cases, we're going to need to know, did the person actually work anytime after March 9, 2020? When were they diagnosed? Were they essential? And is there any other way we can defend them, uh, defend the presumption? So we're going to be looking at, is a family member ill? Uh, do you have a second job that you're working at? We're discovering that a number of the cases that we're currently defending uh, involve employees that have co-employment somewhere else. So we may be able to look for apportionment or at least point to another employee. Um, so this law will take effect September 14th if nothing happens. Now, the governor can still veto it. He can conditionally veto it, and he can sign it. Interestingly, he has been conditionally vetoing uh, COVID-19-related 
uh, bills that have crossed his desk related to municipalities, towns, and governmental entities uh, being able to uh, seek or raise bonds uh, to uh, uh, pay themselves for COVID-19 uh, alleged related losses. So he has been active on this. Uh, but he hasn't acted on this bill yet, which has been now on his desk uh, for 25 days as of today. So we've got 20 days to go before it becomes law. And I'll be certainly keeping everybody informed about what happens with this law. All right, uh, we should have some questions, I'm hoping. So if you haven't typed your question in yet, please type it in now and I will try to answer as many as I can. Uh, one, one question from Ryan says, Greg, we can't hear, the sound is not cutting out. Uh, he said that at 12.03 and I know we did have a couple blips earlier in the beginning, but hopefully you can hear it now. And um, Warren who's sitting over here in this production room is saying, yeah, I can hear you. So theoretically it's working. Um, all right, let me open this window up again. Let's see if there's any other questions or comments. Okay. Jim says, thanks for the COVID-19 update. Uh, you're welcome, Jim. I'd be very happy to give you any good news I could. Uh, but right now, New Jersey looks like it's following the 11 other states or so that have a uh, presumption in place. All right, I don't see any other questions. Uh, next month, we're going to talk about IMEs. We're going to talk about second opinions in New Jersey. Um, we're going to give you some best practices for getting IMEs, uh, how we utilize IMEs, and how we utilize second opinions. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure. I'll see you next month.